Welcome to Theology Thursday, a weekly podcast d- dedicated to devoting... Wow, oh. you messed it up. <laughs> Welcome to Theology Thursday, a weekly podcast dedicated to cultivating theological conversations amongst millennials. You added the word devoted in there. Okay, and then you messed me up with the cups. Well, I was just, I decided to get us water. I'm not even going to take it out. All right, okay, I am your host, Ryan Mock. I'm your co-host, Connor Grubbs. And I'm your co co host, Johnny Grubb. No, Johnny's still not here. He's uh he's not gonna be here for a while. Uh, I just wanted to get you some water, Ryan. Well, I already have water oh. it's, and it has ice in it, it's not lukewarm. Oh. I'm, wow. You're you're welcome. <laughs> okay, I'm sitting well, down I mean, now. I We're ready to go. I appreciate um, the offer, but Okay, but we brought a guest on today, our good friend. Say your name so they can associate the voice with the name. Yes, Hugh Adcock. I'm with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Well, welcome, Hugh Adcock. We're very grateful that you're here today, and we're excited to have you on the show. Ryan and I both work uh, with volunteer staff with InterVarsity, um, and so we've gotten to work with Hugh personally. He's a great partner in the ministry as well as a great friend, and we're really glad that you were able to come join us this week. It's exciting. Yeah, we're excited to have you. Now, um, before we even get into our sub-points, it's like an, an, a pre-intro if you just briefly explain what InterVarsity is. Yeah, um, InterVarsity is an, uh, a national organization that is on um, around 800 campuses and universities um, nationwide. And we exist to um, establish and multiply student-led small groups on campuses um, to transform students' lives, uh, renew the campus, and create world changers as they graduate. So, yeah. I'm excited to talk about it with you guys. We're excited to talk about it. And you can speak up just a little bit. All right. You have to do that. Wow. I I have a soft voice, so. You do. You do. So I just want to make sure we're all, okay. Perfect. Um, So let's do sub points. Ryan, do you have a sub point yet? Are you still? I'm still thinking. This is the second week in a row where you just didn't have one. I'm sorry. I was was asleep earlier and. So. Okay, but I just, I wanted you to know that there's been a couple people that have asked, like, if you or Johnny don't do a sub point, people ask about it. Our listeners actually really like this section. Really? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. So listeners. think about it. Do, it. do it for the listeners. Um, mine is about Johnny Hunt um, joining um, the North American Mission Board uh, as kind of their director of evangelism, I think is his title. Uh, but he's going to be specifically helping with training church planters and pastors to train their churches to evangelize and lead events and conferences that kind of have that focus. So he'll be coming alongside Kevin Azell, who's in charge of the North American Mission Board, which is the Southern Baptist Convention's church planting agency uh, for Canada and the U.S. And um, Kevin Azell is doing a great job, but I think the addition of Johnny Hunt will be really incredible. Here's the amazing thing about Johnny Hunt. And I can't remember the name of his church now. For some reason, it's left my mind. But he has been the pastor of the same church for 33 years. And that's, that's a long time. I have a lot of respect for that because most people in the ministry do not stay that mm-hmm. long. And it may even be longer by the time he leaves because what he announced this, it was a plan of succession with another pastor that they're going to hire. And he told his congregation as far as, like, how long am I going to stay? I'm going to stay as long as it takes. Um, so I just really respect that because a lot of people don't don't last that long at one church, let alone that long in ministry. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's just, it's it, it's a really incredible testimony um, to to stick with it. That's my sub point. And Hugh, it's your first time. Yeah. But I would like you to share something as well. Okay, well my my story is not as as uh as deep. That's okay. That keeps it balanced. Okay. We well, so um, I am married, um, happily married with my wife Catherine, and we have a two and a half year old. Uh, my daughter's name is is uh, Isabella Grace, and um, so my daughter loves animals. Okay. As does my wife. As do um, I. As yeah, do you. I like, I like animals and, also. Oh, well. We're all, we're oh, all That's your sub point. I, okay. okay, I, right, I, I have a sub point now. You're welcome. Okay, right. it's you're welcome. animals. You're welcome. <laughs> you're, 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 you're welcome. Okay, there you yeah. go. Yeah. Right. So, um, I came home, it was over a week now, mm-hmm. 
it was a great day on campus, um, and I heard a peeping uh -oh. in the kitchen. <laughs> and I walked in, and we we now are owners of a baby chicken. A baby chicken. So That's now not where I was expecting that to go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I know, I know you, I know you have a squirrel, right? We do. We rescued a squirrel. That, yeah, that I fell remember out of meeting, my parents' oak tree. I remember meeting your squirrel. Is uh, her name is Pumpkin? So now you, have a, you still have the squirrel, right? Oh, of course, of course. And they so live now, very long. Now you have a baby chicken. Baby chicken. And how old is your squirrel? The squirrel. Ha ooh, it's got to be like five years because we really that is awesome. it was a gift to my wife when we were dating. <laughs> <laughs> so. It's a great story. Um, so, okay. So, like, no, I love. I mean, I love animals too. It's just y'all choose like the unconventional <laughs> type. Like, um, I wasn't expecting that. Like, when at first I was expecting maybe you came home and there was like a cat, and you were like, "Oh no, why do we have a cat?" And then you said the beeping. I was thinking, okay, so maybe it's like a like a canary or some some type of bird, and yeah, it is a chicken, of all chicken man. And now I gotta build a coop. Wow. <laughs> And be laying us some eggs. So they, so they don't even ask you. They just they just get it. They just get it. <laughs> so, so how do you how do you keep it? Like, does the squirrel stay in a cage? Do you the like squirrels in a cage? Yeah, very tame. Mm -hmm. Because we I, I rescued her in the middle of the road when she was tiny, so she didn't even fit in the palm of your hand. Wow. Um, so she grew up with my wife holding her all the time. So she's super tame. Gotcha. Um, so she will she won't even run away. Um, and the chicken, uh, if I guess now I'm I'm a pro, pro on chickens too. Chickens are very clingy, apparently, and so wow. it won't run away either. It'll follow you wherever you go. That's and good. and yeah. so like the squirrel like is domesticated enough that you can like pet it and hold it and like all that. Oh yeah, be friendly. Yeah, yep. Man, that's incredible. I have to come see your squirrel sometime. You do. Like I'm interested it's, now. <laughs> it, we used to bring it to student uh, events, and it would be an attraction. It was it was great. <laughs> I'm sure it was just like the boomerangs. The, yes. <laughs> yeah, we we had boomerangs at a recent intervarsity. Many event, boomerangs. And many, and we had a professional boom, boomerangist. How, how how do you boomeranger? <laughs> I don't know what you call that, but he was really good. It was awesome. It, it was really so was. creative. I loved it. It was great. And apparently, y'all are creative in your choice of pets as well. That's Man, right. this is great. If if y'all are getting anything from this podcast, it's be creative. That's right. Ryan, uh, yours is also about animals, but it's a lot more sad than Hughes. Okay, yeah, let me tell you this story. Mm. So, two to three weeks ago, my family went on a quest to get another dog. Because we have a dog. Dog's name's Macy. She's a fat dog. But we figured we want another dog. And so we went searching for another dog. Uh, we 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 looked at several dogs. Uh, we almost had the opportunity to get two, uh, uh, get one dog, and then that dog got adopted. It was a three-legged dog, and my brother really wanted this dog, uh, but he got adopted before we were able to get to this dog. The other dog, uh, we we were able to get our hands on this dog, and we were at the the rescue. And we, we brought Macy so Macy and this other dog could, could, you know, check each other out. But it turned out that they weren't again they were not getting along very well. So we couldn't get this other dog. So we finally decided to go to a shelter and we found this dog at this shelter uh, down the road. This dog's name is Hank. Um, Hank is very similar to Macy. It almost looks identical to Macy. Uh, minus a, a difference in their fur color, but like facial structure and patterns, like very very similar to Macy. Same behaviors. Hank doesn't really bark. Is very mellow. And so when we laid our eyes on Hank, we immediately got attached to Hank. Hank is a Hank is is a male, and he's he's sixty eight pounds. Uh, we figured out that he is a shepherd hound mix and so that's probably what okay. we think macy is also so we're like we got to get this dog we got the dog right away um and the reason why this dog was in the shelter was because uh, i guess he escaped and the shelter cannot get in contact with the owners so after seven days the dog is put up for adoption and so after seven days they cannot get in contact with the owner and he goes up for adoption so we get hank and we immediately fall in love with Hank. We, we just love Hank. Hank is, Hank is a great dog. And we wondered why such a good dog was forgotten by their owner. Uh -oh. We thought, how could this happen? Why would the owner do this? 
Well, two days ago, we get a knock on our door. And it's, it's two Vietnamese people, and they're looking for their dog. And it's Hank. So what happened was these people went to Vietnam. Um, they live here, but they, they went to Vietnam for some reason, and they left their dog in their house with a dog sitter. Well, while they're in Vietnam, Hank somehow escaped uh, under the dog sitter's watch. And so when Hank was picked up by the shelter, when the shelter tried to contact these two people, they couldn't get in contact with, the, with this couple because they're in Vietnam. Hmm. So when these people get back from Vietnam, they're like, our dog's gone. So they go to the shelter and the shelter gives them our contact information or address. And so that's how they managed to, to, to end up on our front door. Now, Hank was legally ours uh, because we adopted Hank and we went through the right process. So we were not legally obligated to give Hank uh, back to his original owners. Uh, but we felt like it was the right thing to do. Hank had been with these owners, with, this, with these people since he was a puppy and they, they like speak Vietnamese to Hank and Hank listens and they have a really tight relationship. And so we felt that the right thing to do was to give Hank back. So yesterday we gave Hank back to his original owners. Mm. So yeah, like that, yeah that, that's the story. I like Hank too. Now Hank is very happy. Uh, with his original owners, we're sad, but we, I feel it's happy. Kind of a good that, ending, though. Yeah, yeah. It, he, for Hank. Yeah, for it Hank, wasn't. Frank. It wasn't Frank. like it wasn't like he was abused or anything, and his owners were negligent. Like these people actually cared about Hank, and so to see Hank go back to them was very. I, it, it made me happy. Yeah, and I think obviously the fact that they they came and looked for him and, and went through all that trouble to, to find him again shows that. Well, when they when they came. Him. The, the, the lady was in tears. The lady was in tears that Hank had finally been found. She said she wasn't she, she couldn't sleep at night, and they were very grateful that Aww. we gave Hank back. So. Hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that story, Ryan. I think it helps for our listeners to get to know us a little bit better on a personal level. About That's right. About our dogs and our squirrels life, yeah. and our Johnny Hunts. <laughs> I didn't have a very personal story this week. But I mean, my life is is fairly boring right now. And most of the real personal stuff I can't talk about on the podcast. That's true. I'll, I'll try and bring you something soon. Bring you a little nugget. Um, <laughs> that being said, so InterVarsity, my, my first exposure to InterVarsity, um, I want to talk about that first and then we'll get into kind of broader parachurch organizations yeah. in general. Yeah. Um, was last year Ryan was leading the Bible study on the Seminole campus of St. Petersburg College. Yep, yep, um, go Titans. <laughs> and so, um, if those of you who don't know that listen to this podcast, Ryan and I have been friends since like middle school. Heck yeah. And so I was like, I wanted to come check it out. It was my first year of college, Ryan's second year of early college. And, um, because he's smarter than me. Yep, yep. Um, that's why he's the main host and I'm the co-host. Um, so I came to check out the Bible study. And it was so interesting because of the way y'all do a Bible study. You use this thing called O OIA. I want to make sure I got it in the right order. I'm really bad with acronyms. Um, OIA. And um, I've used this method since, not only in InterVarsity, but like even with my own college group as... Um, the director of student ministries here at Azalea, and so like, uh, it's really cool. I'm gonna let I'm gonna let you explain it, Hugh, for our listeners. What what is OIA? Yeah, uh, OIA uh, stands for Observation, Interpretation, and Application, and it's an inductive um, way to study the Bible, but really just to study study anything. Um, but we apply it to Scripture, mm. um, and th- the the beauty of going through this process, this kind of three three-step process um, is it really lets you unpack the scriptures in a very structured and kind of paced way. Um, We tend to a lot of times just want to read a scripture maybe once or maybe twice and then we kind of want to jump to straight away well what does this mean? Um, Like let's let's get to the meat of it Um, where if you kind of slow down and really take your time to figure out what's going on in this story ask hard questions, talk about it amongst each other. Um, and by the end of the time, you really have a, a kind of a deeper sense um, and you've gotten further into the scripture than you probably would have if you hadn't uh, kind of slowed down in that way. 
For sure, and I think one of the reasons that's valuable on a college campus is when they come, they don't feel like they're being preached at, but they feel like they're getting a chance to talk about it, and they can ask questions, and they can, and and that's welcome, that's encouraged even. Um, So it's it's I've found that it always leads to great discussions, and one of the interesting things about it too is at that club and and at our club we're doing now on a different campus, St. Petersburg College, is we have multiple days uh, where the same passage is being read on both days. And when I would come to Seminole last year, I would come to two days in a row, and even if you're talking through the same passage, you get a different group of people in the room, and it's going to be a new conversation every time. Oh, absolutely. Because different things stand out to different people, and that's one of the things, like when we finished our Bible study on Tuesday, the one that I led, so yesterday, yeah, um, one of the people that was there just said, they were like, the thing I love about this is it shows me aspects of the passage even though i've read it a bunch of times and heard it preached on Mm -hmm. before getting to talk about it with a group of people i'm seeing aspects of it i never thought about before yeah and uh, so i I think it's really valuable even in your personal study this is something you can use definitely yep Ryan, do you have any thoughts on on that that you'd like to add yeah when i first you know got started with inner varsity which was two years ago i i jumped right into leadership and and i met you and he was like, this is the way. And I'm like, wow, that's a very nice way. <laughs> I, at first, I, 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 I really wanted to do things my own way, uh, not the Hugh way, uh, the university way. And, I don't know about but, the Hugh way. But... <laughs> well, it's the Hugh way, really. Uh, but, but really, as I, as I got deep into leading an university small group on campus, I, I saw the true value of, of doing things the way university is designed to do it uh, with OIA, the inductive Bible study, and and run in a small group and so at that point we really saw the the effects of the 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 first-hand effects of implementing oia into our bible study that was just the air conditioning i'm pretty sure a demon lives in it yeah i'm pretty sure (laughs) your air conditioner is possessed (laughs) something man yeah it's it's one of the downsides to recording here but uh we'll we'll make it through on. So so, anyways, yeah, I I love I love the way InterVarsity uh, does small groups and Bible study. And if I can add one more thing, um, that, wouldn't you say that that is very reproducible? So if we structure a thing like InterVarsity small groups or any small group for that matter, whether it's a church or parachurch, on just someone preaching, um, you, I mean that takes a certain kind of leader to do that. Um, to lead in this way is very reproducible. Yeah, um, any anybody could really do it uh, right. with just just a little just a little bit of, of, of background on what OIA means. But um, yeah, you don't you don't need to, to have a, a PhD in theology or in philosophy <laughs> to, to 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 lead an OIA. You don't need to be a pastor. Right. Uh, it just requires minimal knowledge on the passage and just a little bit of help here and there. But that's the good thing about OIA is that really anybody can do it. Yeah, and I think the the thing that's so cool about that is uh, you should prepare. Like if you're an inner city leader, you should prepare, read the past ahead of time and study and everything. But like if for some reason, and this happens in ministry, you're, you're doing like a last minute Bible study, do OIA. Like if you, especially if you have a good study Bible that has notes for maybe some of the verses that you're not sure where to lead the discussion on. Like it's something that, even if you're not prepared, and I think especially if you're not prepared, is a great way to do a Bible study. Yeah, yeah. Because it yeah. just starts the conversation. Yeah, and you know, it, when I when I led uh, small groups over at the Seminole campus last year, I mean, there are times where I just forgot that I was going to do this, and so I'm going in blind <laughs> with the passage. Uh, but like, even even despite that, we're still able to have great discussion, um, despite maybe me not being prepared like I was supposed to be. But yeah, OIA yeah. is is fantastic. I think it's definitely the way to go for yeah. Bible study. And it, you know, we we have to be prepared in everything we do in in ministry or, or something like this. Absolutely, if you're, if you're leading a Bible study, um, but the, really the point isn't to get through all of your points. You're you, right to host this kind of if this discussion is really to get people to discover the truth of the Scripture for themselves. Mm. Um, so if your real goal is to have deep conversation. Not to just get through your own points, and so it's it's a just a good way to get to that. Yeah, and I think one of the reasons we're passionate about that here is the the whole mission statement of Theology Thursday is cultivating theological conversations 
amongst millennials. Ryan and I are not the experts. You could go to other uh, people, find books and things like that. They were way smarter than us. (laughs) That are far more qualified to be talking about the things and answering the questions that you guys send. Um, But the point is, you don't have to be qualified or or, or anything to to start the conversation. Mm -hmm. Like, those are great resources and tools, and you should turn to those. But I think we avoid the conversation altogether so often at our age. Uh, because it just seems like this big insurmountable thing like that that is hard to kind of really wrap our words around and we want to start those conversations so like we come uh, to this podcast answering as we pull from study notes from other people because trust us we do oh, yeah. <laughs> um, in preparation and turning to the scripture first and foremost um, to answer these questions uh, knowing that we might be a little bit off maybe we're wrong <laughs> and that's okay that doesn't mean we shouldn't start the conversation. So yep. I think that's that's so important, and that should happen more in the church. And I think Bible study, there's a place for preaching, yep. but I think yep. Bible study should always be more conversational. Yes, yep. I love that. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of kind of the heart behind InterVarsity, and we could sit here and talk about just that all day, and it would be awesome um, because I love what we're doing you know, this school year at the Gibbs campus, and it's just so cool to see students come to know Christ. And, and like, we might have more sub-points about that in later episodes. But for now, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on today, Hugh, is because I know, um, it, explain your position in InterVarsity, what you do. Yeah, so I am campus staff. Um, I'm employed by InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Um, so my job, um, I, when I introduce myself, uh, I think the best way I've found to just describe it in, in short is I am a missionary mm-hmm. to the college campus. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm employed by university, but my vision is to equip and empower students um, to follow Jesus on, the cam- on campus, but also into the rest of their lives. Mm-hmm. Um, because really what I've, what I've found over the years of doing this is that the things that um, students learn on campus are so fundamental and it kind of lays the groundwork um, for really sometimes the rest of their lives if we look back through university alum through the through history so yeah it's I, uh, I think there's a huge potential sure and and briefly like what's your testimony and how God used university in your life as a student yeah and led you to this position ultimately yeah so I um, graduated high school in 2008 um, and I was going to go to a, um, a Christian university, okay. um, and through a few things, I, I guess the best way to describe it was just the Holy Spirit kind of led me to go to school at SPC here, mm-hmm. uh, just a local community college. Um, nothing too fancy, although I am just in love with SPC now and the students, um, uh, but I, so my background is I was always in church, so I was... Uh, the kid that knew all the Bible stories. I knew, um, I knew about God. When I entered college, I don't know if I could say that I was following Jesus. Um, and so when I came into InterVarsity, and that I remember that first Bible study, uh, small group on campus. It was at the Gibbs campus. That was my first mm-hmm. campus that I was on. Beautiful. And um, yeah, I, I just remember looking at Scripture, and I remember looking. I think what you said, Ryan, like looking at this Scripture reading Jesus and his words almost for the first time. And it really revolutionized my life, and, and I was hooked. Um, I loved being able to discuss it with my peers. Um, things like opportunities that you don't have in church. Um, of course, we need, we need church and we need mentorship in that way, but having a space that's on campus um, to be able to ask hard questions um, or just be around um, a community that loves you. Mm-hmm. Um, those years were so formative for me. Um, and so when I graduated um, in 2013 with my business uh, degree, I was um, going, I was actually in the police academy. My grandfather was a police officer here in St. Petersburg. Um, and I had, I was an insurance adjuster. I had my insurance adjusting license. I had a very lucrative offer that I was able to take um, out of state. Um, and through a season of discernment, I really, I really declined all that, and I felt God's call to become staff for InterVarsity. Um, and that was five years ago, and 
it's been an amazing journey since then. God has God has taught me so much. That is awesome. So we've we've given our plug for InterVarsity. Hopefully that has helped our listeners understand a little bit more your heart and your testimony um, and, and why parachurch ministry is important to you and, and to me and Ryan as well. But I want to talk about as our really our main question today why why parachurch what what is kind of the history behind it what is its function um so first of all what does parachurch mean right, yeah for so, listeners who may not be familiar with that term yeah so parachurch or, or parenthetical church um is this idea that isn't super um old really um so if we look at something like the beginning of university um back in the late 1800s um a gr- groups on uh um, uh, Cambridge University in England okay. started to meet and they started to get together and form kind of this group um, so inter-varsity um, that came in the 1900s to Canada and through Stacy Woods a guy uh, that kind of started the plant in America um, and through so what's happened um, the need for doing mission um, really that was is is and was lacking from the church at large, not to say that it it does not happen, Um, but the need to do evangelism, to do mission um, here locally and abroad, um, really birthed um, parachurch organizations. University, if we're talking about student uh, college campus uh, organizations, crew, navigators, university, there's tons of them. but there's a need for them because if we're really, uh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but if we look to most churches, well, hopefully um, if uh, hopefully all of our listeners have a, a home church, a spiritual home that we need, but there's probably not um, a large college group. And if there there is, that's, that's great. But most churches, the college age is kind of this awkward stage, right? Where you have a youth group and usually that's, that's strong. Yeah. And then there's a young adults group. But then there's this gap there where college students are kind of discovering themselves. Right. Um, and so for university college uh, um, campus ministry, um, that's where this parachurch organization kind of fills in that gap. Mm. Um, yeah. And you're exactly right. And I see the value in that on a very personal level because uh, part of my job here is leading the college ministry. Yeah. And I found that I'm the only one in the area doing it. There are a couple churches that have maybe a college small group on Sunday night, but besides one, which you would expect to have because it's the biggest church in our area, besides, right. I'll go ahead and say it, besides Indian Rocks, and they're doing a great job with what they're doing, yeah. but besides Indian Rocks, Azalea is the only church that I know of that's doing a midweek Bible study, so Amazing. what I've found is it's grown really fast because college students, they might have a church that they go to, um... But there's nothing there for them, right? Many, yeah. many of your, many of your students, Connor, they're involved with a church that's not Azalea. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so here's what mm-hmm. happens: you have a few college students that stay at their home church right. or find a church when they go to college, um, if they're really rooted in their faith and that's something they've made a commitment to do. Um, and that's that's awesome. And I'm glad that we've been able to fill that need in our area and and continue to do that through our ministry here. But um, what happens with so many students when they hit that age is because they feel like there's nothing there for them. They just stop going to church altogether. Yeah. Especially true. now that they feel they have the decision to make it themselves. We see so many students right. quit going to church when they're in college. So, and, and what we see on campus is those those students will will still be open to Jesus. Absolutely. Right? But but they they will be um, maybe hesitant to go to a church. So they'll sure. come to something on campus because they still want Jesus. There is still something in them that are open to Jesus. Yeah, and, and hopefully any university leader is encouraging, not you know forcing it down their throat, but encouraging their students eventually to, to get involved in a church, especially as they're yeah. making commitments to Christ. So really, and this is something I know you're passionate about, is, is the parachurch should be in partnership with the local churches. It's a way to meet people where they're at, yeah. but ultimately plug them back into the local church. Right. Because should be the end goal. Right, because the, the primary tool that God has set up, the engine for bringing the kingdom to earth, is the church. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and so whatever gaps prayer church organizations may fill, my, my goal, I think every parachurch organization should want 
um, the church to really do that. Um, right, for sure. Yeah. Um, but it does feel an important need because I know I, I came on um, staff at this church uh, when the children youth college all needed to be developed from scratch. Mm-hmm. And so parachurch was my vehicle, is currently my vehicle for uh, reaching our local community because if I don't have any students, I got to get to where the students are. Right. right. And I have, a, I got to have a way to do that legally <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, in cooperation with the school. And, and so there are other organizations that help me be able to do that. Child Evangelism Fellowship for the mm-hmm. elementary students, FCA and First Priority for the high school and middle school students. And of course now InterVarsity with the college and, um, so, so I've seen on a personal level the value um, yeah. in, in that as well. Um, Ryan, do you have any thoughts? You've been awful quiet. Yeah, you guys have been going at it. Uh, no, I don't have any thoughts. Y'all are doing a good job. <laughs> you got lots of thoughts, man. I know you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so do you know, and this is, this is a random question. I have, I have no idea if you would know this or not, but what was the first like parachute ministry like where where did it kind of get birthed from was I, university it i know was university was was among the, the very first. beginning uh, so. especially among college um college parachurch uh movements for sure uh, but i i can't say that i know the the exact first um i'd like to know yeah we should look into that <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah so that's really cool and i think um you're right. I think it sh- we church churches should be seeing like where where are we falling short that there is a need for this? Yeah. Right. Know. Well, you know, for example, the trade winds, the church I go to, uh, we don't have a college group. Um, I am I am one of two or three college kids in the church. Um, our youth group is predominantly homeschool. We don't have a, a, a parachurch ministry for homeschoolers at the moment. I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's one out there, probably. Um, but are we going to reach the the, the 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 kids in public elementary schools and and middle schools? Um, and so, like us, my church, Tradewinds, being involved with InterVarsity is really cool to see because that's our church reaching out to college students. And so, I'm a very very excited to see. Um, how the relationship with uh, Tradewinds and InterVarsity is going to continue and how that's going to benefit both of us. Yeah, it's, it's, it's unique, too. And I think partnering, because for me, as campus staff, um, I really have a passion to um, find these communities because there's churches, not just as alien, not just Tradewinds, that have people that are in it um, that are passionate and they want to reach college students. Mm. Uh, maybe they don't know how, um, university has been doing this for a minute now. Um, in the United States, I think we're, we were founded in the 40s. Um, so we, you know, so if you come alongside a parachurch like university, um, for me, I want to plant college <laughs> ministries at churches. I want to see churches flourish with college right. students. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's such a huge need. And, um, and just, I, I, you know, I, I, tend to wonder why and how did that group just get forgotten like where along the line did that happen and you know for a very long time youth ministry is a fairly new invention in the church as well for a long mm-hmm. time there was not the idea of a youth pastor is just not a thing yeah. um so even that is kind of new but I, I wonder why in that process college students were kind of left out because it's such a, a formative and confusing time of life I isn't mean, it isn't it and and if we look through history we see really every revolution every change of of, of uh, really through through all of human history most always it started with youth it mm-hmm. started with college age people students student aged uh, people that that longed for change longed for something better um, so why don't we reach the youth? Why don't we reach the college? Why is that not our, our priority? Right. I think it should be. It should be. And like middle school and high school is very important as well. And I think people focus on that because they're like, oh, they're, they're an adolescents and we need to really reach them during that time, which is true. But at the same time, part of the church's goal in that should be to minister to the parents because it's really the parents' job to be guiding their child along during that time. Now, that being right. said, um, 
not every student that comes to youth ministry has parents that are involved. Um, and so the church should be trying to minister, but they also should be ministering to the, to the youth as well. But I think the only reason that college can become an even more important time is because that's when an individual really starts to make decisions for themselves that yes. are going to shape yep. their future. Yep, that's true. Um, and that's when the hard questions come. Oh yeah, and if you're if there's nothing on campus, um, to kind of say, hey, we may not have every answer, but let's figure it out together. Yeah. Um, and to just expect those students that are struggling on campus, um, to go to an outside community like a church or, or some other, um, or group of people, I, I think is is hopeful, at best. Um, right. So uh, to have a parachurch organization to bridge that. We're going where, to where the people are. Yes, and that that is mission, right? That that is that's what I'm passionate about, um, and that's why parachurch organizations really um, really exist. <laughs> so, with all that being said, I think we should kind of summarize. Any closing thoughts from either of you, Ryan? We'll start with you. Any okay. closing thoughts? The close, closing thoughts. For me, okay. So, being involved with InterVarsity on college campuses for the past two years has been probably one of the the greatest influencers of my faith and taking my faith as my own group in a Christian family and my parents are awesome they're 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 the main disciplers in my life um, but I also say have an experience like InterVarsity being in leadership in InterVarsity leading small groups uh, a main influencer for me in my faith. Uh, really, I am a Christian, but really when I got involved with Under Varsity, I really had to think more about what I'm doing, and I had to think more about how to serve people and to how to live out my faith in front of people. Yeah. Um, so I think that, I don't know, just, just my closing thought is, like, Under Varsity is an amazing thing, mm. and... One of the one of the best things I ever decided to do on a college campus, like like people like you know they like I wish I partied more, and, you know, or and people some people are like that, or like I wish you know, I I was involved in sports more. But for me, it was my the biggest takeaway from college was being involved with university. I love that. So if you're a college kid, please do university. I don't. You're really yeah. not going to regret it. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. that's awesome. Um, For me, one of the things from our discussion that I think stands out is like a lot of churches are, there's a a weird stigma that comes with parachurch and a lot of churches are kind of like, ew, I I don't know about that. I don't trust you with necessarily. And and then parachurch is like, there's a stigma. They have a stigma maybe with the local church sometimes is, well, why aren't you guys doing this anyway? You know, and there's, there's this separation that happens and what we've gotten to see through our partnerships, um, is something I think that's really unique and really special and really important. I, I want to see walls come down, parachurch organizations come together yeah. um, with the local church in true partnership rather than it being we're over here doing our thing and you're over Amen. here doing your thing. I think that's so important. And I want to see the local church as a whole. Uh, now I'm going to start preaching, but I want to see the local church as a whole start seeing walls come down because I've um, just because of life uh, in the past month I wasn't necessarily church shopping but I did end up seeing four different churches um, including the one I'm now working at um, in that time I've gotten to meet with so many pastors and see ministry done so many different ways and unique partnerships and friendships have formed where across denominational lines yeah. um, and across the county we're able to partner together to see, you know, we want all of Tampa Bay to come to know mm-hmm. Jesus, and I can reach St. Petersburg uh, in a way that Indian Rocks can't. Right. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be in contact and in partnership. And so getting to see things like that happen, and I'll give you an example. Ryan's Church Trade Winds, they're Presbyterians, which I'm, I'm darn close. You don't <laughs> baptize I, babies. So. But I don't <laughs> baptize babies. I am a southern... Baptist, um, just like John the Baptist and Paul the Apostle and Jesus himself. <laughs> um, wow. <man>. So, uh, <laughs> um, but the point is, we are joining together. We're joining forces 
to start a good news club, which we're doing that through Child Evangelism Fellowship, which is a parachurch organization. So it's a great example of the local church coming together Mm -hmm. and parachurch and the local church coming together. And I just, I want to see more of that happening in ministry because it's really unique. It's just, Mm -hmm. it's, I, 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 and it's not my idea. God is the one doing it, but I feel like I'm part of something like cutting edge. Right. It, it really is. It like it really is cool to think about that you could be a part of this journey of advancing God's kingdom uh, through these partnerships and through these ministries yeah. and parachurch organizations. It's really cool to think about that. I am I'm taking part in this. God is using me in this. Because unfortunately, it just doesn't happen a lot. It so doesn't. and isn't that the thing though? What you said, mm-hmm. the, the kingdom. Yeah. There's there's one kingdom and right. it's coming, and we have to partner together. We have to realize that there's there is uh, there's one uh, there's one church, mm. and we the more walls that we put up, um, the the more money we waste, uh, the more time that we waste, um, when we could really be following uh, Jesus in a way that's so much more efficient and more glorifying to Him. Um, and really just works better. I mean, I think we could all agree that like this partnership that, that we're all kind of experiencing and kind of going on this journey this year is, is unique and it's, it's just better. Yeah. It's just better than if we were all separate and trying to do our own separate things in our own little walls mm. and trying to reach our own little thing uh, without, without each other. Amen. Drop the mic. Oh, that, oh. that was good. Oh, that was okay. good. We uh, <laughs> any closing thoughts from you? Yeah, I um, I I am just uh, if you're a student, um, listening to this and you think that well, I have to get my MDiv and when maybe someday I will be able to follow Jesus, um, I I want to really um, challenge you in that. Um, the doctrine of the believer's priesthood really says that you know if you follow Jesus. Um, you may not know every question, but Jesus, the Holy Spirit, empowers us um, to follow Jesus right away. And I encourage you to see yourself um, wherever you are, where, whether you're on the college campus, whether you're in high school, whether you're just working, um, to see that as your mission field. Uh, because it's, it's really a lie um, from the enemy to say that, you know, well, leave that to the professionals um, to do mission or to, to follow Jesus in a way um, we're we're in the Great Commission. It applies to all Christians, um, and so yeah, I encourage I encourage that to all um, the students especially. Um, yeah, beautiful. Well, this has been awesome, Hugh, and I think I I'm I I love the conversation we had today. I doubt it'll be the last time, um, and we appreciate you taking time out of your day to come and join us for the podcast. Um, so. With parachurch organizations and with uh, church planning, lots of ministries, uh, the money doesn't just appear. So uh, (laughs) a lot of people have to raise support, and it's something that even Paul the Apostle talked about. It's, It's in Scripture. It's not like this is something that we just came up with in our modern era. Um, So uh, we know that a lot of the people that are involved in different ministries in the area that we come to bring on the show, uh, do raise support. Um, so if you could briefly explain to our listeners, we're going to have a link in the show notes where you can go and support Hugh. If you feel so led, we encourage everybody to pray about that. Um, if you could explain to them how that process works. Yeah. So if you go to donate.intervarsity.org, um, that'll bring up the donate page for the university um, the national website. Um, and if you type in my name, Hugh, H-U-G-H, Adcock, A-D as in Delta, C-O-C-K, um, it'll kind of bring up my little profile page and, and you can donate through there. Uh, but I should say, if you're a student, um, d- don't feel like maybe this is a call to you, but, it, but, if, you, but if you are a parent or if you are um, someone that does have a passion to reach um, the college campus um, at SPC, um, yeah, I do want to partner with you, and I would love to not just receive uh, financial uh, help, but um, obviously there's a lot more that I think that you could offer too, and I would love to meet with you. So, um, yeah. That's awesome. Again, Hugh, thank you so much. 
Uh, Ryan, as always, thank you for being a wonderful host. You're welcome, Even Connor. though I'm pretty sure this is the least you've talked on any episode <laughs> of the know. show. I it's, it's funny. I'm, I'm the host, but you do most of the legwork. I don't know why you keep saying I'm the host. But well, I you just welcome. you do the intro. Uh, so. Yeah, well, that's, that's the important thing, right? It's... It, it's pr- done with pretty well. <laughs> well, really, really, the way I've always viewed it is we're both co-hosts. We're co-hosting together. But you, you allow me to say that I'm the host. Yeah, well, because you wanted to, and I was like, well, I mean, whatever. I don't really care. And also, it led to a good joke about Johnny being the co-co-host because he came on later, and it just kind of stuck. Yeah, and I'm I'm just superior to you in every as, way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um. So, that being said, thank you so much for joining us, and we hope that you can join us again next week on Theology Thursday.